The scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 13. Christ gave each one of us a special gift. Everyone received what he wanted to give them. That is why the scriptures say, he went up high into the sky, he took prisoners with him, and he gave gifts to people. And that same Christ gave these gifts to people. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to go and tell the good news, and some to care for and teach God's people. Christ gave these gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving, to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in what we believe and what we know about the Son of God. Our goal is to become like a full-grown person, to look just like Christ and to have all his perfection. So I'm wondering if you all have a copy of our little questionnaire. Does everybody have a copy? Anybody need a copy? Raise your hand. Okay, Tracy, we'll get you one. Ushers, do we have any extra copies floating around? Oh, we've got, Deb needs one too. Here we go, Chuck up here. Thank you, thank you. Choir, do you have a copy? Do you want a copy? You should have a copy. <laughs> we'll get some up to the choir. So what I'd like you to do, if you would, is take a couple of minutes to fill, to fill out this all-important, life-changing, off-the-cuff survey that I prepared late last night. So <laughs> I'm going to ask Bev to maybe play a little something while you fill out the answers. It's only five questions, but I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Can we get some up to the choir? See, you didn't know we were going to be interactive this morning. You know, compassion is the number one quality that unites all the great spiritual traditions of the world. Who, what, when, where, how might differ slightly. But there is a universal consensus that compassion makes the world a better place in which to live. It is the number one quality Jesus requires of us. Though faith, hope, and love abide, and the greatest of these is love, love without compassion, love without works, makes us noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. Now I asked you to complete this little questionnaire this morning as a fun way of testing what compassion really means. Of course, researchers have made a business out of studying the subject. And so according to many, compassion involves five qualities. So let's examine them one at a time. One, you are walking downtown. On the corner of the street, there is a homeless person sitting on the sidewalk. As you approach, you feel, A, annoyed. When will the city get a grip on this homeless situation? And you can raise your hand if you put A. Well, that's good. <laughs> B, how many people said B? Sad, it's a shame anyone has to live this way in this great country of ours. C, uncomfortable. This person is obviously suffering and I don't know what to do about it. And D, what homeless person? There are no wrong answers here, by the way. The first quality is 
recognizing suffering when you see it. Compassion requires an attentiveness of the heart, actively paying attention to how the people around you are feeling. It's not something one can take on all of the time, but it is a spiritual practice worth working on. And so getting in touch with your own feeling of sadness is a good thing. But getting in touch with the person's feeling of despair is another. Second, during worship, the pastor lifts up prayers for three people who are experiencing especially hard times. As you listen, you feel, A, secretly grateful. Thank goodness I am not dealing with these things. <laughs> B, humble. Life is so full of suffering for us all. C, devastated. Oh my gosh, now three more people are experiencing pain and hardship. And D, oops, I missed what the pastor said. And this one kind of caught me by surprise because the second quality of compassion is understanding the universality of suffering as part of the human experience. Compassion requires humility, an admission that suffering is not the exception, but the rule, an experience that touches us all in one way or another, at one time or another. So rather than identifying suffering as something uh, atrocious and exceptional, somehow encountering suffering triggers in us a real sense of humility that there before the grace of God go I. Number three, a church friend has just told you at coffee hour that she and her spouse are planning to divorce. As you hear the news, you feel, A, secretly glad. It's about time she or he ditched that loser. I've <laughs> been known to feel that. B, uncomfortable. Thank goodness my marriage is okay. I hope. C, concerned. I remember when I felt that angry and scared. And D, I think I'll go and grab another cookie. <laughs> the third quality is emotionally connecting with a person's distress. Compassion requires more than seeing suffering, suffering or acknowledging it as a part of the human condition. It asks us to make an emotional connection with the person's pain. Being in touch with one's own feelings, good and bad alike, equips us to enter into someone else's experience, not take on that experience but enter into it. Four, it's Thanksgiving. A relative of a different political persuasion is visibly distressed about an issue you do not agree with. As the conversation unfolds, you feel furious. How can you possibly be so clueless? B, impatient. Sorry, I just can't get on board with your pain. C, sympathetic. I don't agree with you, but you are clearly in distress. I wonder why. And D, please pass the gravy.
This one is a beaut, as Clark Griswold's dad would say. Perhaps many of you are experiencing Thanksgiving dinner anxiety as we speak. The fourth quality is tolerating uncomfortable feelings in ourselves so we can be open to another's pain. Compassion requires us to set aside the what of the situation and be curious about the why. What is it about your sister-in-law's view on abortion that is causing her so much distress? And what is it about migrant children that makes Cousin Frank want to drive down to the southern border and bring them all home? We all have a story. We all have a why. Compassion requires us to profoundly embrace that question. Interesting. And finally, number five, your elderly neighbor, who is notoriously grumpy and unsociable, rarely leaves the house anymore. His family lives far away. As you watch him creep to the mailbox one morning, you feel curious. I wonder what's going on with that old grouch. B, conflicted. I wonder if he's okay. Should I call his family? Do I even have their number? C, determined. He may not welcome the intrusion, but I'm going over to see if he's okay. And D, got to run late for work. The fifth and final requirement is the desire or ability to act to alleviate someone's suffering. Now, this is a tough one in today's world where good Samaritanship may get one into a lot of trouble. But the instinct to show up, to care enough, not to fix their problem, but to walk alongside them through it, is a noble one. That is the essence of ministry, capital M or small m. In today's world, I think it's fair to keep that in mind and do the best we can. So how did you do on the quiz? I hope you were honest. I did not get 100%, and I bet some of your answers were, it depends on the day. My friends, imperfectly we march on. I'd like to close with a quote from my Favorite go-to theologian, Frederick Buechner. Compassion is the sometimes fatal capacity to feel what it's like to live inside somebody else's skin. And the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you as well. I'm going to read that again. Compassion is the sometimes fatal capacity to feel what it's like to live inside someone else's skin and the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you as well. Thank you. Thank you all and bless you for your willingness to answer God's call to serve. Amen.